These days, whenever a game with a competitive element is introduced, one question generally lingers in everyone's mind. Who is the best player in the world? There are a number of ways to determine who the strongest is, and these methods have changed over time, but the most tried and true way when it comes to trading card games would have to be a World Championship Tournament. And, unsurprisingly, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links wasn't immune to this. Welcome back to the History of Duel Links, the series where we take a trip back in time throughout the Duel Links timeline, stopping along the way to look at the major releases, updates, and events that impacted the game's past, present, and future. I'm Diatonic, and this month we're continuing the slow build towards the first ever Duel Links World Championship, examining the next three sets, another meta snapshot, and discussing how Konami chose the championship contenders from a massive pool of duelists. There's still tons more for this series to cover, so if you'd like to be there for every step of the journey, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a like and comment to express your interest in the series. I cover lots of other Yu-Gi-Oh! related topics as well, and I recommend you check out one of my Duel Links deck profile videos, where I build a deck, teach the combos necessary to play it, and showcase its performance in the ranked ladder. But as usual, we've got a lot on our plate for today's video. So let's take flight and discuss the next mini box released in Duel Links. Launched on March 16th, 2017, Wonders of the Sky was the third mini box released in Duel Links, and it included a number of cards revolving around banishing monsters. Whether it was strategically banishing your opponent's monsters to remove big threats, or banishing your own to pay costs, banishing was the main mechanic of the set, as exhibited by a number of its high rarity cards. However, like many of the boxes we've looked at in the past, the mechanic Konami seemingly wanted to push paled in comparison to the cards the competitive community actually chose to adapt. While Konami wanted decks to start making the use of the Banish Zone, Wonders of the Sky ultimately became a box that provided a small boost to the Harpy archetype. Some other cards would see niche play, but ultimately, it seems this box was regarded as skippable. But let's take a look at a few cards from it before we pass judgment. First up, let's have a look at the cover card as usual, this time the level 8 winged beast known as the Atmosphere. It's a fairly generic card that could see play in just about any deck, as it's required to be special summoned by banishing two monsters you control and one more from the grave. Once per turn, you can steal one of your opponent's monsters as an equipped card for the Atmosphere, and it gains attack and defense equal to that stolen monster's stats. Unfortunately, this card falls into the same trap as many others we've seen in this series. It was way too slow when it was released, and its effect is too underwhelming to see play now that it's quite easy to put the necessary materials on board for this monster. This is far from the last card that'll fall into that category, but it does hurt to see so many of them glossed over like that. Next up, the first piece of Harpy support in this box came in the form of the super rare winged beast Birdface. Its first major benefit to the deck was its stats. 1600 attack was nothing to sneeze at in the first place, but under Harpy's Hunting Ground, this card was boosted to a magic 1800, making it a must-have. Combined with its effect, which allows you to add a Harpy Lady from deck to hand when it's destroyed by battle, this card became one of the few truly meta-relevant cards in the entire box. Obviously, Birdface doesn't make any appearances in the modern version of the Harpy deck, but in a world without the rogues gallery of Harpy support we have now, this card was a hot ticket item. For one of the first nostalgia bait cards of this month's episode, we look no further than Summon Skull, a classic staple of the beatdown style of Yu-Gi-Oh! At 2500 attack for a single tribute, even in Duel Links, Summon Skull was probably one of the strongest tribute monsters in the game. Unfortunately, as beatdown was well within the rearview mirror by this point in the game's life, he came just a bit too late to be particularly impactful. Sure, if you could put him on board, he was a definite threat, but the cost was just a bit too much for most. Wonders of the Sky kept bringing us the nostalgia pulls as Black Skull Dragon was also added alongside Summon Skull. It feels like they were trying to push Red Eyes as a deck in this early period of the game, with both Meteor Black Dragon and Black Skull Dragon now present in the game. Black Skull Dragon was a massive problem to try and deal with if he hit the board, but without powerful search cards and easier ways to fuse these monsters, it was rare you'd actually see him. Plus, with the increasing amount of removal and control cards present in the game, he was an incredibly tough sell, especially with no effects and no way to protect himself. Sticking with super rares for one last card, Big Bang Shot was introduced in Wonders of the Sky as an anti-turtle card. Monster stats were still somewhat competitive at the time, so a 400 attack boost alongside piercing damage was something notable. You could use it to punish your opponents for playing defensively or boosting some already impressively powerful monsters to new heights. 
Again, this is another somewhat beatdown oriented card released as beatdown strategies were losing steam, so it suffers the same fate as other cards like Summon Skull and Black Skull Dragon. Dropping in rarity but increasing in viability with this next card, Sonic Duck was the second Harpy support card in this set, and an incredibly important one despite its appearance. Though it was merely a normal monster, its place in Harpy decks was guaranteed from the very beginning as this gave them access to an incredibly easy 1900 attack monster they could drop straight from their hand. This meant that they could dump 1900 attack Sonic Ducks and 1800 attack Bird Faces, a deadly tag team of stats that was very difficult for many to overcome. Effectively, this made Harpies a more evolved version of the Dino Beatdown deck we saw not too long ago. Konami continued to expand on the library of targeted removal spells in this box with the addition of Different Dimension Gate, a fairly free-to-play friendly card. Essentially, as long as it's face up on the field and you choose to banish one of your own monsters, you can banish one of your opponents too. It's a somewhat hefty cost and everything will return to normal if gate is destroyed, but that's the price we have to pay for incredibly cheap removal, as this card was only a rare. If you didn't have access to the more expensive stuff, then it was a decent option. Finally, a normal card from this set that's been seeing some very light off and on play in more recent years, let's take a look at a Pointer of the Red Lotus. At the cost of 2,000 life points and revealing your entire hand, you can take a peek at your opponent's hand and banish a card from it until their next end phase. I personally have seen this card pop up in a few different places, with players looking for ways to bypass the large number of hand traps some decks currently run. But either way, this was certainly an overlooked card at the time, and as it has yet to see a reprint, yet another example of the importance of overviews like this one. You really never know when old cards will have a resurgence in a game like this. This one's a bit on the short and sweet side, which is somewhat expected of mini boxes. but how does Wonders of the Sky stack up then and now? Well, upon release, if you were a Harpy player, this was a welcome addition to the game. Both Birdface and Sonic Duck were excellent additions that helped give Harpies even more threats, keeping them firmly in the meta for the time being. But outside of that, unfortunately, there wasn't much here for you. Free-to-play players had options like Different Dimension Gate to pursue, but with no new killer decks or strategies in this box, it's a lower tier one for sure. For modern Duel Links, there's basically nothing here. Even if you're just looking for something retro to play casually against the AI, there's really nothing here you can use straight out of the box. So sadly, I can't exactly be kind to Wonders of the Sky. I think this box is evidence that Konami needed a little more time to master the mini box formula, as we generally see mini boxes in the modern era as strong additions to the game and a safe haven for players looking to save a bit of money. This box was a definite letdown compared to previous releases, and it's not difficult to see why. Wonders of the Sky may have been a fairly large miss on Konami's part, but it was far from their only opportunity to impress going into the biggest competitive scene Duel Links would ever see up to that point. But if they were to phone in a better lineup for the next main box, what cards and strategies would Konami look towards next? Less than a month later, Konami would continue to expand the Duel Links card pool with the next main box, Chaotic Compliance. First unleashed on April 11th, 2017, this main box was all about one of the most important mechanics in the modern game, Special Summoning. It included support for Psychic-type monsters, Gemini monsters, and of course, as evidenced by the cover card for this set, Ritual monsters. Interestingly, this box does include some cards that you may find playable to this very day, and even cards included in modern-day meta decks, making this one a fairly interesting one to return to. Though some of its Spotlight cards have seen very beneficial reprints in recent years, there are a few somewhat sought-after cards that are still locked in it to this very day. First up, featured as the cover card for Chaotic Compliance, probably the most powerful ritual monster in the game, at least in terms of stats, Black Luster Soldier. He's just a massive beat stick, but one that you can special summon if you can manage to get the pieces together. I know that beatdown isn't really a factor in the metagame by this point, but a 3k body is a 3k body. Surprisingly, despite BLS support being added to the game over time, this card has never seen a reprint. So, sorry to BLS fans, but you need Chaotic Compliance if you want to run a BLS deck. He's strong, but unfortunately succumbs to the same setbacks as other Ritual monsters. Too costly and unreliable. Let's follow up BLS with a fairly decent option at the time, Fusion Sage. Fusion-based decks weren't exactly common back then, as it was difficult to put all the pieces together in a reliable fashion, but Fusion Sage helped to fix this problem. 
Essentially, it was like running extra copies of polymerization, since its effect was just to search it out. Unfortunately, as a main box ultra rare, this thing was just way too expensive to warrant picking up, especially considering most fusion monsters around this time were just glorified beat sticks. Not only that, but it doesn't do much for modern decks, since many of them have archetype specific polymerization cards. Next up, let's touch on a card that would see a fair amount of play during the metagame of the time, the trap card Eliminating the League. It's a fairly oddball removal card that comes with the off chance of being able to completely derail your opponent, should they unfortunately have a critical card on the board and in their hand. It allows you to discard a spell card to destroy a face-up monster on your opponent's field, then check their hand for identical cards to send to the grave as well. Discarding a card was an unfortunate part of the cost, but its usefulness in ranked play and the World Championship qualifiers would far outweigh the downsides. Keep this one in mind, as we'll be seeing it again soon. Chaotic Compliance brought players new ways to disrupt their opponent's plays, making spells and traps far less safer options from here on out. The first card to accomplish this was the Counter Trap Magic Drain, a card that allowed your opponent to either discard a spell card or have one of their spells negated. I particularly am not a fan of cards that allow your opponents to control their fate, but for the time, negation was a welcome addition, as some might have considered spell and trap cards to be way too safe, as previously mentioned. Again, as a main box ultra rare, it's expensive, but not the worst investment. On the other side of the fence, for the trap negation fans out there, Chaotic Compliance also included the classic Seven Tools of the Bandit, a favorite of my fellow playground meta duelists out there. For the cost of a mere 1,000 life points, you could negate and destroy a trap card when it's activated. A simple effect with a fairly low cost, this card could give popular traps of the time like Mirror Wall a run for their money. I'd argue that spells were becoming the much bigger threat around this time, and that seven tools wouldn't be able to make much of a splash. But again, this is still a period of time in the game where anything was helpful. And of course, this is yet another example of a nostalgia bait card, though it's far from the only one in this box. Now, for something completely different, let's take a look at a card from this box that's seeing a surge in play in the modern game, Gateway to Chaos, a field spell that serves as support for BLS and Gaia. When you place it on the field, you can add either a Black Luster Soldier or Gaia the Fierce Knight monster from your deck to your hand. And, each time one of your monsters is sent to the grave from either your hand or field, you can place a spell counter on it. Then, if you've got three spell counters on it, you can pay them to grab a ritual spell from your deck. Of course, this would help set up the summoning of Black Luster Soldier, but the modern Gaia deck can utilize it to grab an all-important Gaia monster from the deck. Unfortunately, this box can't solely claim Gateway to Chaos as its own, as it was reprinted in both the Masters of Chaos and Rise of Gaia structure decks. While Chaotic Compliance was still too early for archetypal fusion spells to be added to the game, fusion decks would see an extra utility card in Fusion Substitute. It sort of acts as polymerization, allowing you to summon fusion monsters using monsters you control as materials. But, you can also banish it from your grave, then return a fusion monster from your grave to the extra deck, and draw a card. Save for the requirement of actually controlling the monsters you fuse with, Substitute is an upgrade in almost every way. Additionally, since it's always considered to be called polymerization, it can be searched with cards like the aforementioned Fusion Sage. This would be absolutely insane if not for its major setback of needing to control the monsters you fuse with. This box gave us plenty of new ways to put more monsters onto the field faster, and one of the more generic ways of supporting that concept comes from Double Summon, a card that allows you an extra normal summon or set on the turn it's activated. Note that it specifically states that you can perform two summons, meaning these don't stack, unfortunately. This one's a bit more of a fringe card that didn't exactly get attention in the metagame, but can be utilized in a variety of casual builds centered around things like Egyptian Gods, for example. Nowadays, yeah, it's pretty rare to see this one dropped. One last card that I personally thought was worth mentioning takes us back to monsters, this time to Crystal Seer. This is a card that could actually get some modern uses, mostly in something like an Exodia build. And, like several other cards we looked at from this box, it's been reprinted numerous times, making an appearance in the very first selection box, along with a second reprint in the Masters of Chaos structure deck. When it flips over, you excavate the top two cards of your deck, pick one to add to your hand, and put the other on bottom, which makes it decent in something like Exodia, but not really worth running in your standard meta fare. But, being a generic card back then did at least give it some value, enough value to see a few reprints. 
So when looking at chaotic compliance as a whole, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. First, like Wonders of the Sky, it didn't make a very big splash in terms of the meta card pool, so it didn't have much influence on the upcoming World Championship qualifiers. Second, the few cards it did have that were at least somewhat playable have been reprinted in much better options, such as Structure Decks. It's unfortunate, but it makes what is probably the best of the three boxes we'll be talking about in this episode not so hot in the grand scheme of things. But as we've learned, many Duel Monsters era boxes haven't exactly held up in the long run. So, we've seen a fairly middling box, and probably the best of the three on the road to the World Championship qualifiers. But there was one more mini box I'd like to talk about this month, which had quite the reputation upon release, and a reputation that has only taken a nosedive ever since. I'll be completely honest. This may be one of the most difficult box reviews I do in this entire series. Land of the Titans, released a month after Chaotic Compliance on May 11th, 2017, is quite the strange card pool. The support included here is mainly for players interested in beast, plant, and rock type monsters, and not much else. In all honesty, outside of one or two highlights in this box, there really isn't much to it. But in my mind, that only begs the question, what exactly is in this box? And would you believe me if I told you that there might be a card or two with some modern applications? Well, let's begin as usual by discussing the cover cards, of which there's kind of two? First up is Yellow Baboon, Archer of the Forest, which some players may find fitting. A not-so-great box headed by a couple of apes. Both of the Baboon Brothers are essentially just sizable beat sticks you can special summon should you meet the conditions. Yellow Baboon can be special summoned from your hand when one of your beast type monsters is destroyed by battle and sent to the grave, as long as you banish two beasts from your grave. 2600 attack isn't an insanely huge body, but in all honesty, aside from the finicky summoning condition, Yellow Baboon isn't the worst. Extremely disappointing for an ultra rare, but in a vacuum, not as awful as you'd think given the reputation of this box. His twin, Green Baboon Defender of the Forest, is, by all accounts, the better of the two cards. He has the exact same stats as Yellow Baboon, but his summoning conditions are far less restrictive. Rather than banishing two beasts from your grave, you just have to pay 1000 life points when a beast you control is destroyed, and you can actually summon him from the grave. Keeping in mind that the beast needs to be destroyed outside of the damage step, Green Baboon really does come across as the more appealing of the two cards. Again, that doesn't mean that Green Baboon is a great card or anything, it just puts him ahead of Yellow Baboon. Sadly, that means both of the ultra rares in this set are disappointing, leaving us with a scant few decent picks down the line. At the time of release, I think the true chase card of the set was located among the super rares, being Gear Free the Iron Knight. Beatdown may have been well on its way out the door, but we got a solid 1800 level 4 beater with Gearfried making his debut. His effect, destroying equip cards that get attached to him, didn't exactly see much playability, but his decent stat line and ease of summoning made him essentially the best recommendation you could have made to anyone brave enough to go digging in this box in 2017. Nowadays, the only Gearfried that sees even a tiny semblance of play is the Red Eyes version, and even that isn't anywhere near the competitive scene. Unbelievably, despite this box's modern day reputation as one of the worst investments you could possibly make, there is at least a single card you might be able to find some use for. Obedience Schooled is a spell card that allows you to summon three level 2 beast type monsters from your deck should you currently control no monsters. They can't use their effects, are destroyed at the end of the turn, and you're locked into special summoning beasts until you can finish the turn. But this card decently supports the recently released Melfi cards you can get from the Eternal Stream main box. They aren't a very commonly used deck, but as they revolve around Xyz summoning lower rank monsters, this card is a godsend for making plays with that deck. If Land of the Titans having any modern playables was a shock to you, would you believe me if I told you that there's a card currently on the Forbidden and Limited list in this box? Needlebug Nest is a fairly simple trap card that, as of the making of this video, is limited to a single copy. Its effect is simply, send the top 5 cards of your deck to the grave. Given that there are way too many decks that love to have cards in Grave in Yu-Gi-Oh!, and also given that there's no cost or downsides to this card, it's really not much of a surprise to me that it's limited to a single copy. 
Heck, it was even reprinted in the first selection box. So if you really need that single copy, you're probably better off digging through the selection box. I wanted to hit on one more card in this box, as it hits pretty close to home, being one of the first archetype-based decks I ever built, and probably one of the first cohesive strategies I ever played. That card is Naturia Pineapple, a staple of Naturia decks in the early days of Duel Links. During the standby phase, if you had no monsters on your field, and no monsters in Grave aside from Plant and Beast type, and you don't control any spells or traps, you can special summon it from the Grave. It also turns all of your face-up monsters into plants. Naturias would become an excellent option for free-to-play players, as they didn't rely on high-rarity cards, nor did they need expensive spells and traps to win duels. While other cards were necessary to make Naturia work as a deck, and we won't see its full impact until later in the series, Pineapple was a fairly important piece of their puzzle. And with that, in all honesty, there isn't much else to talk about here. There's a smattering of mediocre to bad cards throughout the rest of the box, very few of which were ever used back then, and basically zero of which are used in today's game. While I was able to find some positive points to discuss, I really don't think any of them help salvage what's essentially a paperweight of a box. But if there's really anything positive to take away from all this, it's that we probably won't hit this low of a point with future boxes again. And now we move on to the next meta snapshot, and this one brings with it a healthy amount of changes, some surprise contenders, and a nice amount of anti-meta to create a somewhat diverse metagame during this time. We'll be taking a look at upwards of 10 different decks, but before that, let's look at some of the new cards cementing themselves as keys to the metagame. As always, these are cards that saw plenty of play in ladder and other competitive events during the time period, but don't really fall into one specific archetype. First up, although Beatdown was far from the central strategy of the game at this point, we finally get to see cards like the Fiend Mega Cyber and Swift Gaia the Fierce Knight have their breakout performances, being featured in some of the decks that would rise to power on the road to Worlds. It would seem that we hadn't quite gotten away from the need for big bodies just yet, and with the increasing speed of the game, big monsters that had the potential to special summon themselves were highly sought after. They'd be the stars in a few decks that we'll get to very shortly. I think the main differences between them were that Mega Cyber was a more versatile comeback card, in that he could be used in a variety of decks, whereas Gaia worked well in back row heavy decks as a more aggressive play. Since many duels in this era ended up being stall fests, Storm quickly became popular. It was a way to break through the monotony and kill off cards like Gateway into Chaos and Dimension Gate so you could finally get through to your opponent's life points. It also comboed well with other cards like Wild Tornado, as you could turn Storm into a nearly complete board wipe if you tossed Wild Tornado onto the board first. It also comboed well with Big Bang Shot, as you could equip it to an opponent's monster before destroying Big Bang, and, in turn, banishing the equipped monster. Speaking of which, Storm's prevalence made Wild Tornado a popular choice at the time too. It was nice to see a Valkyrie's Rage card getting some attention here. I think the idea was for it to act as a landmine for decks like Harpy, which love blowing up spells and traps, but they actually repurposed it for themselves, just adding to the momentum they received from the addition of Birdface and Sonic Duck. I definitely think it's fair to say that most life point gaining cards aren't exactly ideal for a meta deck, but back in the day, Supremacy Berry was actually making the round somewhat as a staple for life point based skill decks. Of course, the original idea behind these cards was to try and keep you alive for longer, but once players realized they could be used to reset some meta-friendly skills like Destiny Draw and the dreaded 3-star Demotion, this was a no-brainer inclusion for them. Despite its somewhat costly effect of discarding a card, eliminating the League would gain a fair bit of popularity on the road to Worlds. We'll be taking a look at a couple of decks that preferred to try and empty out their hands quickly, so discarding a spell wasn't exactly the worst thing to happen to them, but it worked incredibly well as a disruption card, as even killing off a single monster during your opponent's turn could melt away any and all momentum they'd built up. Finally, with players searching for new ways to protect their monsters, Duelists began to turn to Dimension Gate, an almost more effective version of cards like Interdimensional Matter Transporter. While Transporter worked well against weaker monsters, Dimension Gate could help save your big guys and completely derail the battle phase. Getting the monster back may have seemed a bit tough, but with the amount of Harpy decks and decks relying on the Storm combo, you could easily control when your monsters came back. Plus, the return of your monster counted as a special summon, which could trigger some effects. So, now that we've gotten a look at a few of the new generic key cards, let's jump into decks. 
The meta still saw a diverse pool of interesting and varied strategies being utilized, with a couple of old decks seeing some revamps and a couple of surprise new decks leaping to the top. First up, I'll give updates on decks we've already discussed in past episodes, then I'll go in-depth on the newest decks to hit the meta. First up, unsurprisingly, is Harpies. Anytime a deck receives new support, it sees an uptick in play. But with Harpies gaining access to some strong new tools, they had essentially become one of the best, more budget-friendly decks in the game. In a nutshell, they served a very similar beatdown role to previous decks like Dinos and Water, relying mostly on big monsters to beat over your opponent's field. They also took advantage of other new tools like Dimension Gate for protection, and to take full advantage of Harpy's Hunting Ground, and Wild Tornado to try and clean up the opponent's back row. Combined with big bodies like Sonic Duck, Birdface, and Harpy Lady 1, and it's easy to see why this deck was considered a strong option in the meta. Next up, our old friend Relinquished is back but there have been more than enough changes in the meta around him by now that he's not nearly as strong. While the once infamous Relinquished deck didn't actually change from previous incarnations, one of its biggest tools, the skill known as Switcheroo, was hit with a nerf that made the deck far less appealing. In addition, because the deck relied so much on a single monster, back row options like Order to Charge and Dimension Gate becoming more popular meant this deck had a much tougher time keeping Relinquished in play. You could also add Interdimensional Matter Transporter to the list of Relinquished killing cards. Because of this, a Relinquished variant was born that included Harpies, since they needed ways to deal with the opponent's back row. It was still a fairly decent option, but it was definitely experiencing a decline in popularity and strength. Another deck that was experiencing some growing pains was Gravekeepers. They were off to an impressive start in the previous episode's meta snapshot, but with the ever-increasing importance placed on the back row, their plays were becoming far less safe as time went on. To try and combat this new weakness, the deck went through a couple of changes. First, it welcomed some new tools like Legion the Fiend Jester and Double Summon, hoping to try and quickly set themselves up before the opponent had a chance to respond or dig for back row. And second, their focus shifted from using Oracle's attack and defense reduction instead relying more on cards like Chief to try and swarm the field, all in an effort to speed the deck up. These tactics were, at least, enough to help the deck stay meta-relevant throughout this period, though they were more like stopgap fixes rather than long-term solutions. And believe it or not, the deck that just doesn't seem to die, Weevil Burn rears its head once again during this period of the metagame. It was a genuinely powerful deck with a gimmick that wasn't easily surpassed, so it's not too shocking that it managed to live this long. However, during the upcoming World Championship qualifiers, it would encounter a ton of resistance from some of the game's newest decks. So, despite cards like Burning Land being used to directly counter the heavily played Harpy decks of the time, this insect would soon find itself crushed under the boot of new decks that were quickly rising in power, meaning we won't be seeing much more of it. So, now that we know where our old friends stand in this meta snapshot, why don't we start combing through some of the latest and greatest decks to hit the scene? Starting off, there was a rise in prominence of what I would describe as 20-card good stuff, meaning decks that weren't really focused on an archetype or particular strategy, just decks that had tons of good cards in them. The first of this type was referred to as Balance Handless, named because of its reliance on the balance skill and desire to deplete your hand to summon Swift Gaia or to beef up cards like Flash Assailant. It was a deck that saw how important back row was becoming and cranked up back row powerhouse cards to the absolute limit. Balance gave the deck the ability to reliably get some of its biggest, deadliest monsters into play, such as Flash Assailant and Swift Gaia the Fierce Knight. Because they were easy to obtain and summon for this deck, Balance Handless immediately had a field advantage over the other meta decks of the time. It also leaned very heavily on a nasty combo used to wipe out your opponent's board, being a combination of Storm and either Wild Tornado or Big Bang Shot. If wiping out your cards wasn't bad enough, it also had the ability to seek out Swift Gaia with the Gateway to Chaos Field spell and use Dimension Gate to keep those big monsters safe. It was an incredibly unique deck, at a time where archetypes were starting to rise in popularity. Balance Handless was able to stand out not only as a good deck, but one that didn't exactly play by the rules of the time. Another similarly balance-focused deck was known as Balance Statue. While not the most creative name, chosen for its use of the balance skill and cards like Guardian Statue, it was a very similar deck to Handless. Just like Handless, it relied on cards like Swift Gaia to give it an insurmountable board advantage, but can also include other big-bodied monsters like the Fiend Mega Cyber to help build its desired board presence. I'd argue that the Guardian Statue version was a bit more on the defensive side, as instead of opting for an aggressive back row strategy, it went for more protection. 
Additionally, it ran almost double the amount of monsters as Handless, making that additional protection that much more valuable in the long run. Another skill gaining popularity around the time was Destiny Draw, a skill that's vital to today's metagame. Players had started to realize that if you were able to just draw any card you wanted, then you could pull any counter necessary to stop your opponent's plays. And it was from this idea that Destiny Draw Anti-Meta was born, another deck that falls into the category of 20 card good stuff. While it's very true that you can't include enough cards in your deck to deal with every potential losing situation you may face, it's possible to run enough generic counters to make Destiny Draw worthwhile, and a number of competitive players felt the same way. So, the main theory here was to just run tons of single copies of cards, then use Destiny Draw to pull whatever you needed from this literal Swiss army knife of a deck. But what specifically did it rely on? Like many other decks at the time, it leaned on the combo of Storm and Wild Tornado to try and clear out the nasty back row cards of the era. Only have Storm and no Wild Tornado, or vice versa? No problem, just use Destiny Draw to get what you need. Is your opponent building up a strong board presence and you need a huge body to beat over it? Don't worry, just believe in the heart of the cards and draw the biggest monster you have. Running into trouble and need a very specific card to counter your opponent's deck? Do I even need to say it again? Just rip Possessed Dark Soul from your deck and win. Destiny Draw would definitely be here to stay for a while, though its meta relevance would eventually fall off and it would just be reduced to a pile of semi-decent cards. Next up on our journey through the road to Worlds meta, we actually have another returning friend, but this time with a completely different gimmick. For all of you freaky fish guy fans out there, Mako made a comeback during this time period with Hammer Shark. Though it pales in comparison to a very near future Mako-centric deck we'll be looking at during the level cap increase, this was where our beloved fisherman began to mount his comeback in the meta. So, to discuss this deck, we need to answer the question of why water was dropped from the meta in the first place. Daedalus was a massive beat stick, so what's the problem? Well, as you might have been able to guess by the heavy back row reliance of this period, it was way too slow to play through or counter the oppressive spells and traps we were seeing tossed around. Sure, Daedalus was a big threat, but he was an incredibly easy target for any removal. However, with the inclusion of the all-new Hammer Shark, Water seemed to actually gain some momentum here. Hammer Shark gave Water decks the ability to swarm the field with level 3 monsters, as his effect allowed for a special summon from hand once per turn, as long as it was a level 3 or lower Water monster. Because of this, Water decks gained access to cards like Lost Blue Breaker, which could tribute itself to destroy spells and traps on the board. While this didn't quite rocket them back to the top of the meta, it was definitely something to take note of. They had a unique spell and trap destroyer that could be insanely difficult to stop. But at this point in time, water was sort of like a Diet Coke version of Harpies. I'd say keep this one in your mind, because we'll be getting a much better look at the return of water in future episodes. This next one is a bit of a fringe inclusion, but one that I wholeheartedly believe is worth discussing. We have another skill-based deck, this time based on the skill that best suits Joey Wheeler, Last Gamble. It doesn't see a lot of play in the modern game, but essentially, you drop your life points down to 100, put two cards from your hand into the deck, roll a six-sided die, and draw that many cards. It means you can draw six new cards, or just one. This skill led to countless gimmicky decks being built, especially when things like god cards start getting involved, but that's for a different day. At this point in time, there were some specific things being played in Last Gamble that could, depending on whether or not you had the famous Joey Wheeler luck, do some massive damage. One of the biggest advantages in my eyes was the ease of pulling off the Storm Wild Tornado combo. Ripping so many cards from your deck meant that it was fairly easy to find the pieces necessary to open your opponent up, so it wasn't uncommon to see this heavily favored combo here either. And of course, with Red Eyes Spirit soon to be released at the time, the foundations of a true Red Eyes deck were being formed. But one play this deck had almost exclusive access to was Desert Twister, a decent monster with a nice spell and trap destruction effect that could easily be summoned with cards like Blue Dragon Summoner and Warrior Digreffer. Of course, with Desert Twister only having 2300 attack, it could easily be bested by several other monsters at the time. But I think of the Desert Twister version more as a proof of concept, that last gamble was far more than useless. And of course, what kind of meta snapshot would this be without covering one of the most surprising breakout decks of the format, Three Star Demotion. It was an infamous deck, known for its powerful skill that could remove the tribute cost of powerful monsters of the time, such as Barrel Dragon. While we look back on it now with such an obvious understanding of how powerful it was, keep in mind that, as they say, hindsight is 2020. 
This deck wasn't immediately understood, and was a surprise contender during the final qualifiers. So how did the skill work? Well, it was very similar to cards like Mausoleum of the Emperor. Pay 2,000 life points to summon any level 7 or lower monster you wanted for the rest of the turn. Of course, it's been nerfed since then, but during qualifiers, duelists began to realize just how deadly it was. I'm sure you're wondering how a literal beatdown skill managed to sneak its way into this snapshot. Well, if you've participated in the numerous KC Cups and other tournaments within Duel Links, you'll know that sometimes it's about quantity of matches over quality. All of these events revolve around points earned from every duel, so decks that can win or lose fast are generally favored. And when I say that 3 star demotion won or lost fast, it's no joke. You could use cards like Supremacy Berry to reset the skill and summon again, but you were pretty much always looking at summoning big monsters to swing over everything your opponent played. In all honesty, one of the best benefits of this skill being in the meta was seeing the ridiculous monsters people used it to summon. Of course, cards like Barrel Dragon were great because it had a great stat line and skill, but this thing lets you Sage's Stone into Dark Magician in a single turn. It let you combo a Flame Ogre with High Tide on Fire Island. It made monsters like Guardian Angel Joan a force to be reckoned with. It was a shocker, to say the least. To remove tributes, a core principle of the earliest form of Yu-Gi-Oh? It was practically unheard of at the time. Looking back on this meta snapshot in particular, from a personal standpoint, this is where the idea of Duel Links being nothing more than a shrunken down form of Yu-Gi-Oh was shattered for me. Duel Links had quickly taken on a life and personality of its own, especially through the use of its increasingly interesting and increasingly powerful skills. Strategies and combos that were thought of as inconceivable in Paper Yu-Gi-Oh! were not only being played, but some of them becoming meta staples. Duel Links proved itself to be so much more than a watered-down version of the card game we'd come to know and love. This notion, of course, began to lead people to the question, if Duel Links was essentially its own format now, who was the best? In the last episode, we discussed the first ever KC Cup, the PvP event that paved the way for a competitive Duel Links format that Konami would go on to use for years to come. While the prizes weren't anything to write home about, the competition was fierce and proved the point that Duel Links could work as a competitive game, just like its TCG Forerunner. But what wasn't quite understood at the time was whether or not the competition would go any further. We were still incredibly early in the game's life, and there were so many questions lingering about future competition. Fortunately, we'd only need to wait until May of 2017 to learn that Konami not only planned to host a world championship for Duel Links, but that it'd be held right alongside the TCG main event itself, giving a massive boost to the game's competitive credibility. All duelists would finally have a chance to prove themselves, and show off the game's competitive potential at the Konami Sports Club Honten Arena in Tokyo, with the first round of qualifiers to be held from June 1st to the 12th, and the final qualifiers within the period of June 9th to the 12th. Much like with planning the KC Cup, there were obviously a massive number of duelists eligible to compete in this event. Anyone who had the app could play, and were encouraged to do so by participation prizes like exclusive playmats and sleeves. So that meant it was up to Konami to decide how players would battle their way into Worlds. Here's how it worked. During the initial qualifiers, essentially a new ranked ladder was added to the PvP arena. Rather than your standard ranked matches, you now also had a rank within the Worlds Qualifier event. You'd be assigned a group based on your geographic location, hoping to eliminate some of the controversies of the previously held KC Cup. Ranking up was functionally the same as regular ranked, and hitting King of Games within this new limited ladder would grant you access to the final qualifiers. From there, a very similar format to the KC Cup would be introduced to try and determine who would earn an invite. Players who reached COG would duel against each other for DP, earning points for wins and losing points for losses. It was another points scramble to the top, with everyone fighting for an incredibly limited number of spots in each of the eight regions. The number of invitations varied from region to region, meaning not every region had the same number of available spots. Europe clocked in with the largest number of qualifier spots at three, while North America and Japan had two open slots, and all other regions simply had one. It's not publicly known how each region's invites were determined, but we can assume it was based on size and duelist population. Even if you weren't aiming for the top, or were unable to qualify, there were still plenty of reasons to participate. Everyone who at least participated would receive a mat and sleeves, a set of which you rarely see to this day. 
On top of that, ranking up in the initial qualifiers would earn you a handful of gems, and if you managed to make it all the way to the final qualifiers, you'd receive one super rare and one ultra rare. Maybe not the most insane prize pool, but it certainly made participation at least a little more worth your while. So, the stage was set for the competition to begin. We had a fairly solid format, a somewhat vibrant meta that could lead to some surprise wins, and an overall sense of hype leading into the first major competitive tournament in Duel Links history. But what would a Duel Links PvP event be without a bit of controversy? I'd say this qualifier event was defined by two incidents that occurred. One that was more of a surprise reveal than anything else, and another that truly put a damper on the hype. So, I'll be the bearer of bad news and get the more negative controversy out of the way first. Throughout the duration of the qualifier period, with some Reddit posts being made even on the very first day, players had noticed some odd occurrences within matches. One of the most common was that at the very beginning of the duel, on their first turn, some players would receive a loss, with the game declaring they had run the duel timer down to zero. At first, with very few reports of this happening, it seemed like it was just a bit of a glitch, something that Konami should have worked out before the event. But the reports kept coming, people making Reddit posts discussing their time limit losses, commenters claiming they had been faced with this, with some comments talking about reaching an immediate time limit loss numerous times. With the amount of players experiencing this on the rise, it became clear that this had to be more than just a glitch. It seemed too common to be some sort of bug. The player base was quickly reaching the conclusion that this was some kind of glitch that could be triggered. The likelihood of it being just an accident was decreasing by the day, and players were obviously, and very fairly, upset about the entire situation. Not only that, but with rumors swirling about modded APKs of the app itself being able to give players an unfair advantage, the unfortunate reality was that this qualifier was quickly becoming stained by cheating accusations. Cheating has always been prevalent in the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game, whether it's unfavorable depictions of cheating and cheaters in the manga and anime, or real-life bandit Keiths like the late Roy St. Clair. But in those instances, the worst they could do was ruin players' chances at qualifying for future events and maybe get themselves banned. It was self-contained within that event. But with Duel Links, with something like an altered version of the app running around, these sorts of things could jeopardize not only the legitimacy of the entire 2017 Worlds event, but it could threaten any and all future competitive legitimacy Duel Links could have. Konami couldn't simply stand by and let this happen. They were watching a window of opportunity closing, and they had to do something to try and regain player trust. Thus, following an investigation by Konami into the records of winning duelists during the qualifiers, the company came to the conclusion that there had indeed been some violations of the competition agreement and the content rules agreement. In light of these discoveries, Konami declared that all offending accounts were to be suspended, and any that had made it into the WCS were to be disqualified immediately. That meant that there was a fairly large shift in the leaderboards. Unfortunately, the damage had already been done in many players' eyes. If it was possible for cheaters to not only infiltrate the world's qualifiers, but also make it to the very top, then there was a chance it could happen again. This was an incredibly unfortunate situation that seemed to leave a dark cloud lingering over the Duel Links community for a good while. But from the flames of these cheating scandals, a few legendary duelists would rise and ascend to the world championships. Which brings me to the other major qualifier event I wanted to discuss. Players keeping a close eye on the leaderboards would bear witness to some of the game's early greats rising to the top. Players like Yanstorm from Central America, Tutpup from Europe, Parao from Japan, and even Timmy from Oceania. But there was one suspicious name that nobody really knew, one that was rising through the ranks quickly with one of the highest qualifying scores of all those that made it to Worlds. This was the mystery of Kaiba Boy. Near the end of the first day of qualifiers, he was already at the top of the leaderboard, and there he'd remain, amassing thousands and thousands of DP, with some wondering who the heck he was, and what the heck he was playing. Some claim that not even half a day into the qualifiers, he had somehow reached nearly 100 wins, solidifying his status as a qualifier fairly early on. But who the heck was he? What secret knowledge of the game did he have that put him over everyone else in the race? Well, not long into the final qualifiers, we'd finally start to get some answers. A duelist would eventually unmask himself as the fabled Kaiba Boy, and since his lead was so massive that no one could even touch him, he even revealed exactly what he was playing. Kaiba Boy wasn't some mystery duelist who came out of the woodwork, and unknown who managed to catch a lucky break. No, Kaiba Boy's true identity was a handle that, in the day, was familiar to those paying attention, but now, 
is a household name in the Duel Links community. Kaiba Boy was none other than the founder of Duel Links Meta himself, Decade. While Duel Links Meta was still a growing site and community, its founder Decade was certainly out making the rounds in a number of different tournaments, the Worlds qualifiers included. Not only was he almost assured a spot at Worlds, and not only was his score the second highest among all qualifying duelists, but his ascent through the leaderboard helped the community view Balanced Handless as a much more viable strategy. With its ability to grind down the competition and dump big enough monsters at almost no cost. Decade wasn't the only top ranking duelist to opt for this strategy, and you can find several more deck lists from this qualifier on the old DLM site, which I'll link in the description. It's an incredible feeling of nostalgia for me to dig back through these old decks and compare them to the essentially 100% archetype focused deck building of today's game. Despite all the twists and turns, we made it. The first ever Worlds qualifiers were in the books, for better or for worse. I was on the edge of my seat, reading through the deck lists, watching videos about the qualifiers' experiences during the event, and wondering who'd be crowned the first official world champion of Duel Links. All of those questions would be answered. The first King of Duel Links would be discovered, all in the homeland of the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise, Tokyo, Japan. But, like always, that'll be a story for next time. Stay tuned for the next History of Duel Links, where we'll be taking our last stop on the road to Worlds 2017. Thanks for watching. Be sure to jump into my open duel rooms and tournaments over at my Twitch channel, and follow me on Twitter. As always, if you like this kind of content, leave a like, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next History of Duel Links.